Proper Installation for Performance, Part 1. Welcome to Building Knowledge 101. Watch as we share our expertise on selecting the appropriate curtain wall systems for project conditions to ensure that they withstand the test of time. When you start looking at a project, there are many drivers that influence what system you select. When you look at curtain walls, there's many different options for curtain wall systems out there. And they're all kind of driven by one particular driver or another. Some are very designed for high thermal performance, some are designed for hurricane areas, some for blast mitigation. So those are the drivers. I've listed a few here, wind load, dead load, hurricane conditions, high velocity wind, blast, seismic. There's still environmental conditions, there's code conditions, and there's budget and aesthetics. So all of these are drivers that influence what curtain wall system you might select for a project. The one I want to focus on, the big driver, is wind load, because that is one of the issues that we've seen consistently. When it's incorrect, it's going to lead to failures. So looking at International Building Code, IBC, Structural Section 1600, IBC says that in the components and cladding chart, they want wind load to call, be called out in terms of PSF, pounds per square foot, not miles per hour. And that's to be listed in a components and cladding chart. So IBC says that wind loads are to be listed in the components and cladding chart and also be broken down in terms of positive and negative PSF. So we have a positive wind load, we also have negative wind loads. And also since wind load is not one size fits all, Wind load is going to vary across elevations. So IBC and components and cladding also want you to break down the building into elevations and zones because wind loads change based on where on an elevation the wind is hitting. So it's not all the same all the way around a building. It's going to change. Now let me give you a couple of examples of that in just a moment. But again, going into IBC 1600, it says that it's designed for registered design professionals requirement. If you look down here, this says it is the registered design professional's responsibility to list these components in terms of PSF, and you're to call out what the basic wind speed is, the wind importance factor, wind exposure, and then internal pressures. And what this is all pointing out is ASTM 7. So we're looking at ASTM 7, which is the means of calculating wind load. So we're all using the same formula for calculating wind load, and these things need to be called out, wind speed, importance factor, building exposure, and internal pressures and the height of the building. And all those are fed into the calculation to come up with the wind load. And then the next thing is the wind loads to be called out in a components and cladding chart. This is located in the general information section of the structural drawings. And you'll notice in this example of a components and cladding chart, it's broken into zones. We have W, E, WP and EP. You can see that's corresponding to a chart representing the building here. You can see where the, the zones are listed. Here's W in the center, E in the corner, and EP at the corner of the, going up to the roof line. So I mentioned earlier, wind load is not consistent all the way across a building. It varies. So based on, on what zone you're looking at, the wind load is going to change. So let's look at an example here. In zone W, we see the positive wind load is 17 PSF. But if you look in EP, the negative wind load is 32 PSF. So you can see it changes across that building based on what elevation we're out looking at. So if we took that first wind load of positive 17 and evaluated the entire building based on a wind load of 17 PSF, we would be terribly short and falling beneath what the wind pressure is going to wind up being in the corner zones along the roof line. So that's why we have to look at zone by zone and make sure we're looking at the worst case scenario and then relax a little bit in that center zone W or zone four is often referred to. But we've got to calculate the high extremes you're going to find on the corners and on the back side of a building. Now this is a page from AMA's curtain wall design manual and I point, want to point out something here. If you look on the left side of the page, you'll see a title that says wind loads. So let me read the sentence for you. It says the principal load to which a curtain wall is subjected is the load caused by the wind. So AMA calls out that the number one force that's subjected, that all curtain walls are subjected to is the force of the wind. And when you think about it, that's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, it doesn't stop. So the curtain wall, once it's out there, it's going to be constantly exposed to the pressure created by the wind. Now, if you look in the right side, the second column, you'll see a heading there that says curtain wall failures. 
Now let me read a line here. Alma says the most common type of failure was that caused by high negative loads in which panels, glass, or windows were sucked off of the wall. So if you look at this picture here, you can see the elevation was not blown in. Most people think that the force of the wind is gonna be the positive hitting directly on an elevation, but the greatest wind pressure is a negative on the backside as the wind passes around a building on the corners. You can see from this picture here, the frames were pulled off of the elevation. They weren't blown in. They were sucked off of it. So the anchoring system looks like it failed because they probably underestimated the negative load on the back side of the building. So Ama points out in their design manual, the number one cause of curtain wall failures is underestimating the negative wind load on the back side of a building. So beginning, the number one thing we want to concentrate on is getting the right system for the project conditions. Project conditions vary a little bit. I can build a building in it here in Atlanta, Georgia, but move the same building to Denver and the wind loads can be considerably higher and the system I use in Atlanta might not work in Denver. Then if I move it to um, along the coastal line, let's see someplace Miami or Jacksonville, Florida, because of high velocity wind loads there, I might not have to change the system again. So each project has its own unique design pressures that need to be considered. So getting that wind load correct is the first thing we really want to concentrate on. Secondly is ensuring the system is properly secured to the structure. Now this might sound like a no brainer, but you'd be amazed how often that is not gotten correctly. Now buildings are not static, they're dynamic. You can see from this illustration here, buildings move. This is representing seismic conditions. So this would be along the West Coast. So this is kind of extreme. But during the day, wind blowing on a building, buildings constantly move. They're not, they don't just sit there in a static condition, they're constantly moving. That is all we have time for in this video. If you'd like to watch more of our 101 video series, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Conair Company, Inc.